Hey everyone, um, I am going to go ahead and do chapter four through this teaching video since, well, I'm not there. Um, I've done this before with a, a summer teaching this and it worked pretty well, so I think you guys should get a lot out of this. So this is covering chapter four. We're skipping chapter three since it's about nucleotides, and I said we're going to sort of leave that on a back burner since you've heard a lot about it from genetics. Uh, chapter four uh, is about proteins um, and anything related to proteins, especially structure, primarily primary protein structure. Um, this is a little bit different than other times I've taught biochemistry in the book I've used in the past. It actually split up. Uh, the book I used to use split up amino acids into its own chapter and proteins into its own chapter. So, um, that's sort of kind of what I'm doing here. Um, I looked at the PowerPoint and the material provided, um, and I was not really that satisfied with the level of depth they went to went into on amino acids. So what I'm doing is I split the PowerPoint up uh, for Chapter 4 into two parts, the first part focusing exclusively on amino acids, and I also added some items to it. And this particular video is going to deal with that first part, which is uh, going to focus on amino acids. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, the second half of the PowerPoint will be discussing proteins specifically, and I'll put up a separate video that discusses proteins as well. Okay, so right now we're all go we're going to be all about the amino acids and also looking into a few uh, initial peptides that can be made. All right, so I've got the PowerPoint up here. I'm going to be sort of flipping back and forth between the PowerPoint and then also I have a, a, like a whiteboard app type thing that I'll use to draw stuff on. All right, so hopefully you won't get seasick me constantly switching back and forth between screens, but like I said, it seems to have worked pretty well in the past and it's basically the same type of information and material that I'd be giving you in person. Okay. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, what we're going to be doing in this chapter. Um, obviously, as we said in the past, <clears throat> amino acids serve as the monomers or the building blocks to forming polymeric chains uh, of uh, amino acids, which are called proteins or polypeptides, right? And so um, probably the major focus of this part is going to be what we call the 20 essential amino acids. Um, when we say essential amino acids, these are the ones that are actually used to make proteins. They're not the only ones. There are other amino acids out there. They're just not commonly found in proteins. Um, and they, they even sometimes they are in proteins occasionally, but not on a regular basis, right? So we're going to sort of start off with that, and we're going to be really looking at what are the structural features of these amino acids and how can we classify them? All right, so if you remember previously, we went over the sort of the general structure of an amino acid, right? Um, we said that there's basically three parts, I guess four parts actually. There's the carboxy terminus, right? Which you see over here in red, COO minus. There's the uh, amine, amino terminus, or N-terminus, which you see over here in blue. Uh, it's labeled NH3+. You have those two connected by a CH, and then that C also has an R group, right, which is illustrated in green. I have mentioned in the past that these carboxy terminus, the carboxy terminus and the amino terminus, they're, they're sort of drawn as charged here, but they're not always like that. We'll talk about that more in depth. I really want to focus more on the side chain now, because like I said previously, the side chain is what identi identifies a particular amino acid. It gives it its identity as glycine or leucine or aspartic acid or, or whatever you want to call it, right? And so you will need to know, you will need to learn the structures of these 20 essential amino acids. One thing that can make it a little bit easier is a couple of things. Number one, realizing that for the most part, the only thing that's different is the side chain. And B, we can actually classify these side chains into some categories that can make it a little bit easier to remember. 
All right. So, and again, depending on which book you use, these will be categorized a little differently. I'm going to try to keep it, you know, the, the guidelines I give you, I'm going to try to keep it going to follow the, the book that you're using. So there won't be any confusion. All right. So really the first primary classification of our groups, of the side chains, has to do with whether they're polar or nonpolar, right? Polar, nonpolar, hydrophobic hydrophobic, we've talked about that in the past, right? Okay, we know that for to have polarity, you need the presence of an electronegative atom, one or more electronegative atoms, to cause separations of charge, right? One thing that you'll notice about some of these amino acid side chains is that they're entirely just hydrocarbons. If you look at alanine, right, it's just a CH3 group. If you look at valine, it's just an isopropyl group, right? CH3, CH, CH3. If you look at phenylalanine, it's just a CH2 and a benzene ring, right? All these are hydrocarbons. <clears throat> and you guys remember, neither carbon nor hydrogen are electronegative, right? So if you're not electronegative, you're not creating a separation of charge. That means all of those groups are nonpolar. And if they're nonpolar... Do they like water? No, they don't like water. That means they're hydrophobic, right? So things like that, alanine, valine, phenylalanine, those are pretty easy to remember, right? You have leucine over here, you have isoleucine, um, also that kind of fall into that easy to identify category. All right, I'm gonna go back over here. Um, I'm gonna look at tryptophan. If that sounds familiar, yes, that is the same species as what you've heard of with regard to like, uh, if you've ever heard about a lot of tryptophan being found in Turkey at Thanksgiving and stuff like that, um, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about this amino acid. So this one also falls into hot, to the hydrophobic slash nonpolar category, right? One thing you'll notice that's a little bit different about tryptophan as opposed to the other ones that we talked about is, is that this one actually does have an electronegative atom, right? It's got a nitrogen in it. So there actually is a small area of polarity sort of localized around that nitrogen. However, if you're talking about the side chain sort of as a whole, you have to look at proportions, right? You have one small little polar area, but a pretty darn big hydrophobic nonpolar area as well. You have these two five-membered rings. This benzene ring is entirely nonpolar. And probably about four-fifths of this uh, five-membered ring is going to be nonpolar, along with the CH2 that's attached. So even though this one does have a small polar spot in it, by and large, the whole thing does not have very high polarity. So it's, it's going to be hydrophobic. If we look down here at methionine, we can have a similar situation. S is somewhat electronegative. It's in the same uh, column as oxygen, but not as electronegative, right? But it's more electronegative than carbon. So there is a slight amount of polarity in methionine side chain, but the nonpolar portion sort of outweigh it, right? So on the whole, methionine side chain is considered nonpolar and hydrophobic, all right? There's one more amino acid in this category, and I say this one for last because it's very different looking structurally. Um, I said that the rule here was is that you have the carboxy terminus, you have the amino terminus, you have the CH in the middle, and then you have a side chain, and it's very predictable. This is the exception to that rule, right? It still does have all those parts, but one thing that's different about proline is, is that you see the little shaded part there, that's the side chain. The side chain actually sort of curls around and will actually form a bond with your amino terminus. So it actually forms a ring there. This is unique. This is the only one of these amino acids that does this. So just kind of a quirky little exception. We will see in future studies, though, that the this unique structural feature of proline does allow it to do certain things that the other amino acids can't. Um, and vice versa. There's some other things that the shape sort of prevents it from doing uh, as well. In this case, the entire side chain part is hydrophobic 
it just sort of curls back and bonds to your amino terminus. All right? Okay, so those are the ones that have hydrophobic R groups. All right, and here are some that have hydrophilic R groups or polar R groups. All right, so all of these are going to have a separation of charge, a pole, at least a, one polar spot within their side chain, and that polarity outweighs any non-polarity that might be included in the side chain, right? So you can see several examples of this. A lot of oxygens and nitrogens here. Serine, CH2OH, right? Very polar. Threonine, not quite as polar as serine, but because it does have an extra carbon, but still certainly strong enough to be classified as polar. Tyrosine is another uh, aromatic, it's, gonna, it's got another one of the ones that has an aromatic side chain. It's got this OH on the end that puts it into the polar group. Asparagine and glutamine each have uh, primary amid groups. That's the C double bond O with the NH2, right? So two electronegative atoms there introduce a good bit of polarity. Okay. A couple of these, cysteine and histidine, and hold on, did we see these before? No. All right. Okay, so cysteine and histidine are a couple of examples. They're not the only ones. Um, tyrosine, threonine, and serine could also potentially do this as well. Some of these polar side chains have areas that could either give up or accept a proton, right? If we look at the carboxy terminus, I think we've talked about this before. You know, these are the carboxy terminus, sort of the default way that these are represented by the book is a COO minus, but we've talked about it can exist as a protonated portion. It could be COOH. NH3 plus is kind of the default, but you could have NH2 with a neutral charge, right? So we know the carboxy terminus and N terminus are places where you can protonate and deprotonate. Certain side chains have that ability as well, <clears throat> All right? So cysteine right here is an example. It's got a thiol group, an SH, right? That thiol group can deprotonate and you can have it exist as an S minus. Histidine has this five-membered ring with two nitrogens, right? One of them is capable of it accepting a proton under the right circumstances, so it is possible for it to exist um, in this form, right? So all of these can happen. Then you have sort of this third category, um, and... I'm trying to think of a great way to put it, but I think the best way I can put it is that this third category exists of the ones that are most likely to have a side chain protonation or deprotonation. All right, so sort of a almost a subcategory of the second group, the polar R group, right? In the other book I used to use, they actually classified these as, a, they called these acidic and basic um, side chains. So um, that's because they are most frequently involved in these acid-base reactions. So you can see with lysine, there's a nitrogen there that could either exist in a protonated state as a positive or deprotonated as neutral. Same thing with arginine. And then aspartate and glutamate each have these carboxylic acid groups on the end that can be protonated or deprotonated. So important note here, um, the way they have them drawn is deprotonated. They call them aspartate and glutamate. If these have the OHs instead, the O minuses, then they're called aspartic acid and glutamic acid respectively, right? So aspartate and aspartic acid, they basically refer to the same amino acid just one has a deprotonated side chain and the other one doesn't. All right? So, I hate to use the memorization word, but sometimes we do have to use it. You will need to learn these 20 amino acid structures, so definitely go ahead and start getting you know, familiarized with them. All right, hold on. I'm trying to catch up to myself in my 
the notes that I have over here on the side. I want to make sure I covered everything. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned a couple of these, right? Unique amino acid structures. We've already talked about proline. Proline, like we said, is very, very different. The side chain kind of loops back and bonds with the amino terminus. It's also useful to sort of highlight glycine here. Glycine is what we consider to be the simplest amino acid, right? It's the simplest amino acid because its side chain is literally just a hydrogen. That's it. Very, very small side chain. Um, and that does allow it uh, an important role in protein structure, as we're going to see in the second half of this chapter. Um, the smaller the side chain you have it on amino acid, the more able you're able to sort of work it into a chain and cause little loops that can sort of curl and turn around. Um, they're involved in something called reverse turns. So we'll talk more about that as we get to them. All right. A um, couple of others that are not listed here in the PowerPoint I just want to highlight. Um, aromatic amino acids. There are a couple of them. I highlighted one already. Where is it? Where's tryptophan? There it is. Tryptophan has a benzene ring in it. And tyrosine has a benzene ring in it. Right? These are actually fairly closely related compounds. Um, and there's another one. Oh, phenylalanine. Here we go. Phenylalanine. So there's going to be three uh, amino acids that have aromatic groups. And... There is a lot of interconversion uh, between these the three different ones, depending on what type of enzyme you might have present. All right. And another one I wanted to highlight is cysteine. Where is cysteine? Cysteine, right here. This is the only one with a thiol group, and that's actually pretty important. I'll go to my whiteboard here for a second. All right. So... What I'm going to do is I'm going to represent a couple of cysteines, all right? And I'm just going to abbreviate it CYS for cysteine, and I'm going to draw the thiol group hanging off of it, right? If we get a couple of cysteines with their free thiol groups together, those thiol groups can actually react with each other. and connect the two cysteine residues. This is called a disulfide bond. And that's, yeah, that's, that's not, yeah, that's a term that's not unique to amino acids or proteins. That's just a chemical group. S, single bond S is referred to as a disulfide, right? So that is a disulfide bond. Um, Whenever you form this specifically between two cysteines of two different protein structures, that forms what we call a disulfide bridge, right? And it sort of links them together, right? So instead of having two long polymer protein chains, you, make, you link them together and now you have one, right? One really big one that's just sort of connected. We're going to find out later on in chapter four that this is an inherent, this is a, an inherently crucial feature in, you know, formation of the proteins and making them into a useful, reliable structure for their purpose. All right, so, yeah, cysteine is a very, very important amino acid. Okay. Even when I'm even when I'm doing this by myself here, you know, I'm just so used to like going over something and then, and then like going into discussion. So it's like I almost just am compelled to ask you guys if you have any questions, even though I know you're not gonna respond. So but that's actually something to consider. As you're going through this video and the stuff that you're that you're working on now, be sure to write down any questions. Um these can be questions that you can think of for yourself to kind of look up. There can also be questions that you can ask me and or some of your classmates about. So, yeah, if you got any questions, go ahead and be gathering them up. 
Okay, so like I said, there there are other amino acids out there, right? It's not just these twenty. These twenty one these twenty like like I said are the ones that are most commonly found in proteins. There are a few other ones, some of them occasionally found in proteins, and some of them that sort of have standalone functions by themselves, including as as hormones. All right. So here's a few examples here, and what you'll see a lot of times is that um, other amino acids, a lot of times they're just simply derivatives of the 20 ami essential amino acids, right? So, for example, if you look at the top there, proline is one of our 20, right? Um, there's another one that's really closely related called hydroxyproline, and that just simply has an extra OH group hanging off of one of the, carb one of the uh, carbons in the side chain, right? Same thing with lysine, right? Lysine over here, you see, and right next to it, you have hydroxylysine, just has an extra OH group, right? So, subtle difference, but it can make an important overall difference in the function of the amino acid and the protein that's part of, right? Hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine, they're found in a few different things, but one of the most prominent ones they're found in is uh, a, poly a protein called collagen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about collagen later on, but collagen is found in a lot of um, very structural features of biological systems, ligaments, tendons, that type of thing, right? Um, so the properties of collagen, they have, they have to be kind of tough, uh, durable, not easily broken apart, and both hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine can contribute to that. Why? I'm trying to think. I literally am thinking to myself, do I want to answer that now or do I not? I'll go ahead and tell you. Extra OH means they're extra capable of hydrogen bonding as opposed to their non-hydroxylated counterparts, right? And we'll see the importance of hydrogen bonding once we get to actual protein structure. But in essence, these give extra hydrogen bonding that helps to sort of um, stabilize the physical structure. All right. Uh, one more example here. You can see we have tyrosine, which is one of our 20. Um, this one's a little bit more derivatized than the other two, right? Um, you have this big other benzene ring, uh, as well as some iodines and an OH. Um, this is a derivatized form of tyrosine called thyroxine. And this is one of those can, that can act as a standalone uh, compound. This is actually a hormone that is secreted by your thyroid gland, and it's used um, as a portion of reg regulation. It's used, to, it's used to regulate various different forms of metabolism within the body. Right? People can have deficiencies of thyroxine or abnormal excesses of it, and either one can be controlled with medication. So, lots of other examples. These are just a few of them. Okay. Catching up in my notes. Give me a second. Okay. All right. Well, those are the those are the major structural features of amino acids, right? So, once we have amino acids, what do we do with them? Well, we know, of course, they're the building block of proteins, right? Not, they're not just the building block of proteins, but they're also the building blocks of smaller, uh, smaller peptides, right? If we think about it, an amino acid is, a single mo is the single monomer, right? If you link two amino acids together, then you have a peptide, specifically a dipeptide. If you link three amino acids together, that's a tripeptide. Four is a tetrapeptide, and so forth. Um, and eventually, you get a lot of them on there, then it's a polypeptide, which is a synonym for protein. All right? And of course, to do this, we make the peptide bond. Well, let's learn a little bit more about the peptide bond, right? The peptide bond is just straight, a straight-up organic reaction, an organic chemistry reaction. Um, Basically, what happens whenever you have a peptide bond is that you have <clears throat> the carboxy terminus of one amino acid reacting with the N terminus 
of another amino acid. And the resulting connection is the peptide bond. Now, the mechanism for how this happens can vary a little bit depending on whether your groups are protonated or deprotonated, right? So we said both the carboxy terminus and the N-terminus can be in different protonation states. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll show you just sort of a baseline mechanism that, you know, is pretty universally accepted, right? So... Generally speaking, let's say we have that should be a two. Let's say we have an amino acid over here, and this is the N terminus, right? And then we have the carboxy terminus of a different amino acid. Okay? So this is just a straight up what we call nucleophilic substitution. All right? And if you remember nucleophilic substitution from organic chemistry, it means that we have a nucleophile. Right? A nucleophile is something that is either negative or partially negative that is attracted to something that is positive or partially positive. Right? So we have this nitrogen over here. It's got an unshared pair of electrons, and we know nitrogen's electronegative. Right? So this is going to be your nucleophile. This has got a partial neg on it. And this carbon right over here, the carbonyl carbon, it's got a partial positive on it. It's a great place for nucleophilic attack because these two oxygens are greedy. They're withdrawing electron density from it, so carbon is partially positive. Right? So you get that attack. And in the process, a pair of electrons from the pi bond hops up to your oxygen. I didn't really think this through as far as drawing this part, so apologize if the bonds are drawn a little aesthetically unpleasing. Okay, so this is where we are after we get the initial nucleophilic attack, right? One thing I didn't draw before was the electrons on this oxygen. I'm going to go ahead and fill those in just because it's important to see. Once this pair of elect pi electrons goes up to the oxygen, now it's got three, okay? All right, so you get to this point. And then you also have a pair of electrons on this oxygen over here. So, basically what will happen is this oxygen and these electrons will grab a proton from nitrogen. These electrons will stay on your nitrogen. And you'll end up with that. All right. The last step is that a pair of electrons that were promoted to this oxygen fall right back down. And this acts as a leaving group. All right? You guys learned about leaving groups in organic chemistry. Water is a fantastic leaving group. So... When all is said and done... Oops, I forgot to draw an R group. Sorry about that. I knew something was missing. When all is said and done, you form your peptide bond right there. And then water is given off. 
right? This is an example of a condensation reaction. Um, anytime you have a condensation reaction, some sort of small molecule is lost. It doesn't have to be water, but water is probably one of the most common. Uh, water, NH3, uh, CO2, HCl, all those are examples of condensation byproducts. In this case, the condensation byproduct is just water. All right? But more importantly, we have our peptide bond. And this mechanism works no matter which amino acids that you have. Right? So anytime you're asked to draw the mechanism of, pep of a peptide bond, strong hint there, uh, thinking forward for exams, that's how you do it. All right. So, for example, here's a good practice one for you guys to work on, right? And you could literally just pick out any two amino acids. It doesn't matter. But this one has leucine and glutamic acid, right? So try a few of those, and let me know if you have any problems ca catching on with the mechanism. Okay. Okay, so... Let's say this happens several times, right? You know, in this case, in this example right here, you've got four of them all linked together, right? So there's a customary order to drawing your peptide, whether it's di, tri, tetra, whatever, right? You always want to draw them from what we call uh, the N-terminus end on the left to the C-terminus end on the right. Your peptide is always going to have a free amino terminus that hasn't reacted, and it's always going to have a free carboxy terminus. Always make sure the N terminus is on the left and uh, the C terminus is on the right. Okay? Uh, just a little bit of terminology. I've even used this a couple of times. The different amino acids that are found in here are oftentimes referred to as residues, right? So a protein with a thousand amino acids would have a thousand amino acid residues. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the peptide bond itself. I'm trying to not to, I'm trying to scroll this up so I don't reveal too much. I kind of want to do this sequential. Oh, shoot. I spoiled it. I, darn it. So if you're not aware, you know, as a teacher, part of teaching is telling stories, narratives trying to build suspense. I was going to try to tell this story of the peptide bond in a certain order here, but I didn't realize this was already spoiled in the comments, so never mind. All right, let's look at the peptide bond. One thing about the peptide bond is that it's really stable. It's stable not only chemically, but also physically as well. Why? Well, let's take a look. All right, so we're going to look at this in a couple of different contexts. The first is chemical stability, right? So back in organic chemistry, you probably learned about several properties, features that would help to chemically stabilize a molecule, a functional group, whatever, right? One of them is resonance. Right? If you remember, you can draw resonance structures when you have available unshared pairs of electrons and or pi electrons, right? The ones, you know, those are commonly found in double and triple bonds. All right? We have an abundance of that here, and in fact, peptide bonds are what we call resonance stabilized, right? Here's what we mean. I'm going to erase what I just wrote, just so I have more room. All right. Let's see if we can draw a resonance structure of this. So I want to draw my resonance arrows, right? So what can happen here is it's very easy for these electrons in this general area to spread around, 
right? And that's something that, in general, makes electrons very happy. The more electrons can spread around, the more stable they are, right? So resonance is one of the ways that we can do that. Hypothetically, let's say, you know, we had this pair of electrons on nitrogen. Is there anything stopping them from sort of hopping over here and forming a double bond with carbon? No, there's really nothing stopping it there. It's directly adjacent. They can do that. The only thing is, is that that would give carbon five bonds, which is a big no-no. However, carbon can actually alleviate that by taking a pair of its pi electrons and just giving them completely up to, car to uh, oxygen. Okay, since the nitrogen has four bonds instead of three now, it's positive. Since the oxygen has one bond and three unshared pairs, it's negative, overall neutral, all right? In reality, if you remember the reality of resonance structure, when you draw resonance structures, neither of them actually is the true form. The truth really kind of lies sort of in the middle. So a lot of times we can represent that with what we call the resonance hybrid. So... This is probably, that's supposed to be a partial positive. I screwed it up. There we go. In reality, it sort of looks like that. This is kind of useful to show, though, because it really shows the purpose here is that those electrons are spreading out. They're not just sitting in one spot. That makes them happier, right? So that means peptide, bron peptide bonds are pretty hard to break chemically because they're already happy the way they are. They're resonance stabilized they don't really see the need to react. They're very energetically favorable as they are. Okay? So, that's the reason they're so chemically stable. We'll see in chat, we'll see once we get to prote actual protein structure, though. This also adds to physical stability of the protein. Right? Proteins, as we are going to see, are very dependent on having a certain folding structure. They're a lot like ribbons in a lot of cases. They have to, they're these big long ribbons and they have to be sort of folded up in a certain way um, to allow function, right? And they have various forces, structural features sort of holding them in that form. And one of those, uh, one key to that is gonna be the, the peptide bond. One thing about the peptide bond is, is that we have has no free rotation around the carbon-nitrogen bond with it. All right, so if we draw a peptide bond, right, we're talking about this bond right over here. Right. Normally, whenever you have a single bond, you can have free rotation. Literally, you can have atoms spinning around a single bond, sort of like blades on a helicopter, right? Or a windmill, right? And this constant movement means that the physical orientation of your molecule constantly changes, right? However, this doesn't happen with this bond, even though it looks to be a single bond. Why is that? Well, the answer is the same as it was previously, resonance. We know that even though in this structural example, we draw it as a single bond, you know, I could draw the resonance structure of this. And guess what? In this resonance structure form, it's not a single bond. It's a double bond, right? The truth, as we said, in the hybrid, lay sort of in between. Almost sort of like a, you could informally call it a one and a half bond, uh, if you will. Basically what that means is that this bond, this nitrogen to carbon bond, has what we call partial 
double bond character. If we have even partial double bond character, it's going to be locked into place and you're not going to be able to spin around it. And that's very important for the peptide bond because, like I said, that helps give the backbone of proteins of that certain amount of st physical stability. All right. Um, peptide group is planar, right? All atoms in the peptide bond are sp2 hybridized with a trigonal planar geometry. And that will be important later on when we talk about hydrolysis of peptide bonds. And there's a little figure sort of illustrating some of this. All right. All right, cool, cool. So we've talked about the structural features of amino acids and then also formation and features of the peptide bond. Let's talk a little bit about peptides. Not proteins yet, but peptides. Of course, once you form a peptide bond, you've instantly formed a peptide of some sort. And there are all sorts of very interesting, useful, um, biologically active peptides. I'm not going to go over all of them because that would just take insanely long. But I do want to highlight a few of them just so you can sort of get a taste of, of their importance um, and see why amino acids mean more than just being building blocks for proteins. All right. Um, Here's an interesting one that you guys probably have heard of before. It's called aspartame. Um, aspartame is actually a dipeptide of aspartic acid and phenylalanine that's been derivatized a little bit. Right? So if you look at the far end of this structure here, you see that OCH3. The carboxy terminus end of phenylalanine has been converted into an ester. So it's been altered a little bit, but there is a peptide bond between aspartic acid and, um, and phenylalanine. All right. Aspartame, if you've probably heard of it as a sweetener, right? It's used in lots of diet drinks. Um, people will use it as an artificial sweetener for their tea. Um, it's found in some desserts and gum, gums and stuff like that. Supposedly it's like 200 times sweeter than sucrose, which is regular table sugar. I hate aspartame. For some reason, I cannot form a taste for it. It actually tastes kind of bitter to me. Um, but then again, I'm just weird, I guess. All right. Um, you see the L's there in the name, L, aspartyl, L, phenylalanine. L and D is, the terms L and D, as you see in the third bullet point here, those are referring, those are referring to stereoisomers. So L and D is another stereochemistry system. Um, you guys learned about RS in organic chemistry. Uh, there's another one called LD that's used quite a bit in biochemistry. I'm not too worried about that right now. We'll talk more about the LD system once we get to carbohydrates, right? But it does show you, it is sort of a good indicator of just how important stereochemistry is in a lot of these functions. Um, there are L versions of amino acids. There are D versions. Um, funny thing about this one, if, the, if, this, if aspartame was formed using the D versions of these amino acids instead of L, they would actually impart a bitter flavor for most people instead of a sweet flavor. So that's just kind of interesting. So kind of a neat little quirk. Um, you've probably heard of aspartame being brought up as far as different health concerns. Um, a lot of people have, are afraid it's, it's a cancer-causing a cancer -causing agent. That is largely, I think, very overblown and kind of mythical. Um, Technically speaking, it could give you cancer, but you'd have to consume an ungodly amount of it. Uh, so that's really not the biggest uh, realistic health concern of aspartame. But there are certain people for which this would actually be pretty deadly. Uh, and those are called phenylketonuriacs. So there's a, there's a disease called phenylketonuria that is as genetic uh some people are born with it and um 
It's what we call an inborn error of metabolism metabolism. There's some sort of genetic mutation or coding that happens to where something that is part of a normal metabolic pathway gets kind of screwed up, right? So that's why we call it an inborn error of metabolism. Um, so here's what we see here in uh, PK, people with phenylketonuria, or PKU is what we call it for short. All right, and it's all centered initially on one amino acid, and that is phenylalanine. By the way, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, all the amino acids have a standard three, there, there's two abbreviation systems for them. They all have a th standard three-letter abbreviation, and they all have a standard one-letter abbreviation. I like to use the three-letter one, uh, and that's what we're seeing here. PHE stands for phenylalanine. All right, so if you have phenylalanine in the body, there's a couple of different fates that it can, it can um, uh, there's a couple of different things that can happen to it, all right? One thing that can happen to it is that it can be converted into tyrosine, all right? Now, this is a metabolic reaction, and as we're going to see as we go on, most metabolic reactions are all catalyzed by an enzyme, right? A biological catalyst. Um, this particular enzyme is called phenylalanine. Hydroxylase. You can actually tell a lot about the function of an enzyme by its name. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Phenylalanine hydroxylase, its job is to take phenylalanine and stick an OH on it. And when it sticks an OH on it, it converts it into tyrosine. So that's one fate of phenylalanine. There is another fate that can occur that takes it on sort of a longer metabolic pathway. All right, there's another enzyme called transaminase that can convert phenylalanine into a molecule called phenylpyruvate. And phenylpyruvate can go on to a couple of things. It can be converted into phenylactate. Hold on. Yeah. Phenylactate and then phenylactate can be converted into phenylacetate. Okay, so this happens all the time. In a normal functioning human body, our phenylalanine goes each of these directions, right? However, people that have PKU have a deficiency of this enzyme, natural deficiency. They just don't have very much of it, if at all, right? So what do you think that does? Well... If you got a bunch of phenylalanine in your body, that means a lot of extra phenylalanine is be, being converted this way towards this pathway. And that's bad, right? We have phenylpyruvate, phenylactate, and phenylacetate you know, in a, a certain concentrations at all given times. But in this case, we have too much of it. And that's a problem because all three of these are, have some level of toxicity. The really most problematic one is phenylpyruvate. If you have too much phenylpyruvate, this can interfere with conversion of a molecule called pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. I'm kind of giving you bonus information now because we haven't gotten this far in the semester yet, so I don't know how familiar you are with this. But pyruvate is a product of glycolysis, and then pyruvate gets further converted into different things through citric acid cycle and electron transport to give us the energy that we need. Um, <clears throat> part of that is this conversion into acetyl-CoA. 
if we have too much phenylpyruvate, that interferes with it, right? So that's that's bad. So um, if you have PKU and you have too much phenylalanine, you have too much of this phenylpyruvate, basically what happens is, uh, and this is most active in your brain, it can cause, uh, this happen in your brain can cause large swelling and it can cause severely... Um, impaired cognitive function and if left untreated it is deadly it will it will kill you so not good right however pku is not a death sentence it can be controlled um you just have to be very very careful about your diet you want to avoid anything that has phenylalanine whenever possible so um if you actually look on a lot of food and drink labels, you'll see a special message to people that have PKU, like warning that this product does contain phenylalanine or that this does contain aspartame or something like that. So they can be sure not to consume it. So pretty interesting uh, dipeptide there. A couple of other ones. Uh, glutathione. This is actually a tripeptide. Um consisting of glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine uh, bonded to each other. Um, this is a what we call a radical scavenger, an antioxidant. Um, you've heard that term probably a lot in, in marketing and stuff. A lot of thing, a lot of, a lot of things can get into our body that are what we call oxidizing agents and these can attack biomolecules sometimes. Um, especially your DNA and RNA. So basically, something like glutathione kind of acts as a shield. It takes one for the team, right? And instead of allowing your other biomolecules to get bombarded with this and oxidized, it itself will interact with the species and be oxidized. This can happen, and no toxic materials are made as a result. All right? So if you look at this slide over here, you can see that glutathione, thanks to that cysteine residue, it's got a thiol group hanging off. Look in part A here in this picture. All right? So what can happen is if you have an oxidizing agent present, basically what happens is two molecules of glutathione are each oxidized. And you can see that in part B, right? And what happens is, as they're oxidized, they form a disulfide bond. We mentioned that a little bit earlier, with each other, right? To form this, form this product. This is non-toxic. This does not hurt anything to make, but it does enable some of your oxidizing agents that are present to be used up and then less available to attack other portions of the body, other other biomolecules. All right. Uh, another one I want to just mention really briefly is called enkephalins. Um, you probably, you may not have heard of these. You probably have heard of their cousins, which is which are called endorphins. Um, and they actually behave in pretty similar manners. So I can kind of use endorphins as an example here. These are natural analgesics, all right? So you may have heard of an endorphin rush before, right? Um, same thing happens with enkephalins. Maybe you're like, you know, running or something and you're just like really struggling, but then you sort of break through the wall and you have this little period where you sort of break through the wall and you sort of are feeling euphoric. You don't have as much pain, etc. That's because of a natural release of enkephalins and related materials. Um, these are pentapeptides. There's a couple of different types that are illustrated down there. Uh, there's five amino acids in each, uh, re I've, amino acid residues in each one. And you'll see that each one of them contains both tyrosine and phenylalanine. Um, and each of these has aromatic side chains. And this is actually pretty key to its activity. The way these work is that you actually have opioid receptors within your body that will bind can bind to these enkephalins, and when they bind to each other, that's when you sort of get that pain relief, euphoric feeling. Stereochemically, 
the three-dimensional structure of these peptides, thanks to their aromatic side chains, they sort of, I guess, sort of lack of a better term, fit in to the active side of these receptors, almost like a hand in a glove. So they just, it allows them to fit in very well. And that's what causes the signal to the brain that, hey, we're feeling pretty good. This is actually how morphine works. Um, morphine and other opioids, you know, heroin, op opium, etc. <clears throat> these have structures that sort of can mimic the general shape of enkephalins, endorphins, and related compounds. And so what happens is you're sort of artificially bringing something in to bind to these receptors in place of your enkephalins to give that brain the signal that you're supposed to be feeling good. Right. So a lot of drugs work like that, not just with, you know, in this case, but um, stimulants. You know, there are receptors for natural stimulants in the body, sort of like dopamine, that are sometimes mimicked by not natural stimulants like methamphetamine or cocaine. So pretty interesting. OK. All right, deep breath. We're on to the last part of this discussion, and this is going to be a little bit of a changing of gears. I'm going to go back to talking about amino acid structure uh, rather than peptides, but we're going to specifically look closely, more closely at the acid-base properties. Right? I alluded to the fact multiple times that amino acids can exist in different protonation states. That's why sometimes, you know, you'll see the carboxy terminus, for example, drawn in its protonated form and sometimes not. All right. So if you look at each one of the 20 essential amino acids, all of them have at least two places that could potentially protonate or deprotonate. It. It's going to be your N terminus and C terminus. Sometimes your side chain will as well. If your side chain is acidic or basic, that can give you a third place, all right? Most of them only have two. Some of them have three. Here's a table. This is not in your book. This is one I imported from another book, but keep this handy. This is a very, very important resource, and I will allow it, you guys to use this resource on an exam. This tells you basically which amino acids have two ionizable spots, glycine all the way down through proline, and then also the ones that have side chains that are capable of protonation or deprotonation. Aspartic acid all the way through arginine. There are seven of those. So 13 of their amino acids have two ionizable spots. Seven of them have three. Sorry, I paused to get a drink of water there. All right. So, it's important to recognize... What are the contexts when you mark, you're going to have a, uh, a group of some sort? Sorry, my iPad is getting thrown around here. Uh, it's important to recognize what context you're going to have a protonated group and what pro a context you're going to have when you have a non-protonated group. All right. Let's go over an example. All right, and just because I'm lazy and I don't want to draw a bunch of complex structures, I'm going to use the simplest one. I'm going to use alanine as an example, right? Alanine has a carboxy terminus. I'm trying debating how I want to draw it. I'll draw it. I'll extend the drawing. One second. Got an H. Its side chain is H. This one is the simplest one. And then we have our amino terminus. I'm going to go ahead and draw it like that. 
Okay. So what you can do is you can sort of represent the different protonation states that happen by sort of imagining going from one extreme of the pH scale to the other. So let's start off at really, 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 really low pH, a very acidic environment. Okay? All right. <clears throat> let's say the pH is zero here. If you look at your pKa scale, right, and we're looking at alanine, right, the pKa for alanine is 2.34, or excuse me, 2.34 at the carboxy terminus, 9.69 at the amino terminus, right? So you're very well below each of those, so that means everything is going to be protonated, all right? You're not going to start deprotonating anything until you start approaching a pH the level and the level of uh, the first pKa value, all right? Looking at these two, 2.34 and 9.69, that can tell you which group deprotonates first, right? Which group does deprotonate first, the one with the lower pKa or the higher pKa? If you don't know, think about it. Look it up. Awkward pause in there, so you're looking it up. It's going to be the one with the lower pKa, right? The lower the pKa, the more likely something is to lose a proton. So, if we start off here, and we start ratcheting up that pH of the solution, and we sort of cross the threshold of the first pKa, that means we start deprotonating, right? So then we start going into our second form. It looks like that. It's important to note we can have we can note the total net charge on each one of these, right? The first structure at very very low pH, it's got a neutral carboxy terminus. It's got a positive one on the amino terminus. So overall, that structure has a plus one. This one, negative on the carboxy, positive on the amino. So it's got no charge. By the way, a molecule such as this has a special label. It's got a special name. It's called a Zwitter ion. It's German, so it's not Zwitter ion. It's Zwitter. It's pronounced with a V. The Zwitter ion is something that has an overall neutral charge, but individual charged portions that cancel out. Okay? So, if you get the pH above 2.34 but still below the pH of your second pKa, that means this neutral form is the, pos is the uh, predominant form. Well, let's keep on raising that pH. Let's say we raised the pH and surpassed our second pKa value. Right? At that point, we're going to see that NH3 group deprotonate and form NH2. And when it goes from NH3 to NH2, it becomes neutral. And in this case, we have a negative carboxy, a neutral amino terminus. So overall, the charge is negative one. So going from very low to high pH changes the overall charge on the molecule from plus one to neutral to negative one. You can see this sort of illustrated here, and this, this is, this would hopefully look familiar from Gen Chem. This is a titration curve. You remember those. I'm sure you love doing titration curves. However, this is very useful to sort of let you see what's going on as we go from low to high pH, right? I can't draw on this with my stylus, so just I'll verbally describe it. At the very beginning, 
right? Everything is in the fully protonated form, plus one. That's where you see the H3N plus CHRCOH. That's what's represented there. That's the first form. You add hydroxide to raise the pH, right? Once you get to a pH of exactly 2.34, you actually have equal amounts of the fully protonated version, that's plus one, and then the Zwitter ionic version. You go above 2.34, and the prominent version that's present is this bitter ion. Okay? You keep on going. Keep on going. I will talk about PI in just a minute. We'll skip that for now. You keep on going, right? And eventually you start approaching the second pKa, right? At the second pKa, once, you, once you've gotten the pH to exactly 9.69, you have equivalent amounts of the bitter ion, and of the minus one version. And then once you go past that, the fully deprotonated version is the one that's most predominant. Seems a little complicated at first, but it's actually very simple once you get the hang of it. Uh, let me go back to PI. PI stands for isoelectric point. That tells you the pH at which the molecule has no net charge. So at any given time, you do have different concentrations of these various charged species, plus one, neutral, negative one, whatever. There is a certain pH where there is an overall net charge of zero. All right, And this is how you calculate it. It's very, very simple, especially for something like alanine. All you have to do to calculate the PI is take the two pKa's and average them together. Right, Add them up, divide by two. And that tells you the pH. So for alanine, once you get the pH to be at 6.02, the overall net charge is zero. And for all intents and purposes, everything is in this bitter ionic form. Easy peasy. It gets a little bit more complicated when you have one of the other seven that has three uh, ionizable groups, but still you form, you follow the same basic process, so it's not too bad. All right, let's look at histidine. Histidine has three spots. It's uh, the pKa of the carboxy group is 1.82, of the amino terminus it's 9.17, and of the side chain it's 6.0. All right, so we actually have in this slide here, these are already drawn out. All right. <clears throat> So, again, just like with alanine, at pH of zero, very, very low pH, everything is protonated. So, your carboxy group is protonated, it's neutral. Your amino terminus is protonated, and it's positive. And then um, the left nitrogen on your side chain is also protonated and positive. So, histidine at very, very low pH, you have a, a, a net charge of plus two. You increase the pH. Which one of them deprotonates first? Well, you can always tell if you're confused by looking at the pKa chart. Lowest one deprotonates first, right? So the carboxy terminus is going to deprotonate first, so it acquires a negative charge. Amino terminus is still positive. Side chain is still positive, so now it's got a plus one. All right, look at your second pKa. That's going to be on the side chain, right? Six comes before nine, so that one's going to deprotonate next, all right? So if you go to your third structure there, now we see that the side chain has become neutral. So we have neutral side chain, positive amino terminus, negative carboxy terminus, net charge of zero, that's our Zwitter ion. And then lastly, as we get to a pH of 9.17, we see deprotonation of our amino terminus and you have a negative net one. All of these with three ionizable groups have four possible structures based on protonation state. The other ones all have three. All right. 
Isoelectra point is a little bit more complicated here, although it's still not hard. Um, if you have an amino acid that has more than two pKa's, here's what you do. Use the two pKa's that quote unquote surround this bitter ion or the neutral structure. All right? So for example, if we look at histidine, where does our visitor ion appear? It's the third structure, right? Look at the two pKa's that surround it. The two that surround the visitor ion are pKa2 of 6 and pKa3 of 9.17. So to calculate pI, it would be 6 plus 9.17 divided by 2. And I'm not good enough at math in my head to figure that out, but you guys can do that. All right? And that's all. That's, there's one sort of extra bit of analysis there, but it's not too bad. Okay, I think I've about had it. My voice has anyway. And this is actually the end of the part one anyway. So I will leave it there, and I'll come back next time with part two, dealing with proteins themselves. Have a good one. Bye-bye.